Welcome to CBSBaltimore.com. David Hildebrand, Elizabeth Champ, welcome. Thank you. To online. <laughs> to welcome to WJZ online. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn, Musical explain. Musical Maryland. This is a history of music in Maryland, right? Starting colonial times all the way up to the age of radio, as you say. Mm -hmm. Now, you both, uh, you both at the Peabody? Yes. Been there since 1994. You've been there since uh, well before that. <laughs> before that, a little before that. But we're talking one of the great <laughs> musical uh, institutions in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. And you, you both certainly have a wide ranging interest in music. But what, what, why did you put this together? We were invited to actually. Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, Bob Brueger, the editor, contacted us each separately and said, I've got a book that needs to be written, and I know each of you have specialties in those different periods of time. So I cover from the beginning up through the Civil War, and Elizabeth, who's really looked a lot at George Peabody and the founding of the conservatory and into the 20th century, did you, the other half. You just blew me away. On, yeah. on, on air, we didn't get a chance to get mm. into that. It's daunting enough mm -hmm. if you decide you're going to write. Oh. Uh, let's say uh, Lynn has a, a newborn, a mm -hmm. little toddler. Seven. Not a toddler. Well, anyway, eight months. Oh. Eight, but, but if you decided you were going to write a book about mm -hmm. the first six months and what parents should expect, right. fine. But if somebody comes to you and says, you're going to, that's now a big, yeah. that's a daunting big task. task. Well, I, I had just defended my dissertation and got my doctorate, and I thought, wow, being asked by a press to write a book, I'll do it. Little did I know. <laughs> well, what's, what's your doctorate? Musicology from mm -hmm. Catholic University. Wow. I'm an American music specialist. That's what I teach at Peabody. Oh. In fact, I'll be teaching a book on that, uh, excuse me, a course on that book again in the spring, oh. a graduate level course. Music I, guess, I, guess, I guess a question would be, does every state, I mean, look, we're all proud of Maryland, you know, does every state have a rich musical history? Is that part of the fabric of what of what we know of the United States today, the, the musical history, the history of an individual state? Or is Maryland just really special? Well, of course Maryland is really special. And, you know, we started an awful lot of trouble at Peabody. It literally changed the course of music in, Maryland, in the U.S. How? Well, it was the first conservatory of music, which meant that people didn't have to go to Europe to become famous. And, uh, and, well, I mean, just locally, uh, Peabody people started Baltimore Opera, Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Choral Arts, and f went off everywhere. Wow. Huh. Now, let's go back to colonial times for a second, because I can get the, I, I get the part that, uh, the book, part of the book that you wrote, because now we're going to enter the, the age of, of radio. And even before that, there's going to be, I guess it would be uh, even the early eras of vaudeville before that. We're now presenting live music. Well, let's go back to colonial times. I guess there were pub bands. Well, phew, the, the piecing together of our musical story in the colonial period is really something because you have to look at newspaper advertisements, you have to look at primary documents that describe meetings of, of say, the gentleman's group called a Tuesday Club that met in Annapolis in the mid-1700s, from 1745 to 55. And uh, these guys kept a rich record of their club meetings, what they sang, they composed music. In fact, really the earliest composed chamber music in North America was done in Annapolis mm. in the 1750s by these guys. And um, other ways you find out about it are printed broadsheets. We didn't have much published music in Maryland because it's a complicated process. It, you know, the Carr family, when they showed up in Baltimore, uh, and published the Star Spangled Banner a few decades after they started. That was unusual in the late 18th century. Most music survives either in hand copied lyrics, yeah. to which people knew the melody, or they're occasionally printed in broad sheets, just a single sheet of paper with lyrics on it, which is how the Star Spangled Banner first circulated. I want to get. I want to talk about Star Spangled mm -hmm. Banner really quick. Then I'll mm -hmm. move to something. Tell me. So, would the actual Star Spangled Banner itself? been potentially the first widely distributed broadsheet? No. What was? Uh, that's a hard question. I mean, there were tons of broadsides. Probably, if you go back to the Revolution, um, there was one set to the tune of the British Grenadiers called General Washington, or War and Washington. So by the time... That was widely printed. So by the time Key, but by the time the Star-Spangled Banner came, the infrastructure was there to get it printed and get it out. Yes. 
And Which is critical. It. Absolutely. There were a thousand broadsides run off once Key got back to shore. Uh, after the 14th of September, of course, it was a couple of days, he got back to shore and he ran the lyrics down or sent somebody down to the newspaper office and they printed off a thousand copies. Huh. And then they ran over to Fort McHenry, they ran around the streets, mm -hmm. they handed them out, and it was just a sheet of paper saying the defense of Fort McHenry at the top. Wow. It wasn't called the Star Spangled Banner originally. Wow. And it named the tune that it was to be sung to, mm -hmm. to Anacreon in Heaven, or the Anacreontic Song. And everyone's go, oh, I know that tune, and you just sit and you just read down the lyrics sing it to, to, yourself. That, mm -hmm. to that tune, or sing it to your buddies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had yeah. no idea that was the name of the song. It I'm was. sorry for sounding ignorant. Notice I didn't say stupid. Well, you haven't read the book yet. It's just came. Well, that was well, 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 very. <laughs> okay, now I want to morph up for a second because you take the latter half, just as influential as Colonial Annapolis and Baltimore were. Now you've got the age of radio in Baltimore. You've got Pennsylvania Avenue. You've got the Sphinx Club. You've got Billy Holiday. You've got some of the greatest names in the history of modern music from about 18 blocks from here. Mm -hmm. Right. My goodness. It is. The history keeps piling on. That is a wonderful realm. That you know, part of it, it was a man named Ajax Thomas, who was a fabulous teacher and musician. And when you talk to you know some of the old timers and you know, ask them who was really an important person in their lives, it's like, A. Jack Thomas. But you know, the musicians on Pennsylvania Avenue, I mean, during the day they were playing in, you know, what was then the Colored Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so they were doing, you know, Vivaldi and Beethoven during the day and then just playing wonderful jazz at night. Wow, what history. U.B. Blake, another good name to... to Cab Calloway? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 could, we could just keep rolling them oh, out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> rolling them out and rolling them out. Wow. Listen, we talked about it on the air, uh, and Lynn was... You're, it's beautiful, this guitar. Yeah, it's a copy of one built in Paris in the 1690s. Um, back then, they were very, very fancy, ornamented. You can maybe zoom in and see this lovely cut paper mm -hmm. rosette that it's simply a, um, an ironed, bleached paper. It's very light, it doesn't affect the sound. But this is the ancestor of the modern classical or folk guitar. Um, and we know this fellow Thomas Wall, who was very active with theater troops. He toured through Annapolis, um, Baltimore, Chestertown, and he offered to teach guitar on the side after they did their shows. And, and in fact, I was going to demonstrate just a, a Go tiny ahead. little yes, verse. Yes, please. Well, in, Opera, believe it or not, the first recorded opera in North America, British North America, with orchestral accompaniment, took place in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, hmm. in 1752. Go figure. Upper Marlboro, not a thriving metropolis anymore. But it was a tobacco port, and, and there was a lot of wealth. And so a group of gentlemen from Annapolis, including members of this Tuesday Club, took their instruments on the road, went to Upper Marlboro, and they did the Beggar's Opera. Now in the Beggar's Opera, there's this teeny little love song called Over the Hills and Far Away. And, and it's just a simple ditty, but within two years, the French and Indian War has broken out. So instead of the love song version of Over the Hills and Far Away, we find published in the Maryland Gazette, a recruiting song. New lyrics to the old tune, again like Francis Scott Key and his process of parody. And so instead of, um, instead of, I would love thee every day, Every night we'd kiss and play If with me you'd fondly stray Over the hills and far away That's the love version. Instead you have On fair Ohio's banks we stand Musket and bayonet in hand The French we beat they dare not stay But trust to their heels and run away hmm. You know, you're a real Renaissance guy. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because you have that colonial sound down. You have the colonial picking down. Meanwhile, dude goes and plays in a cover band. <laughs> Mini Van Halen. There Mini, you go. Mini, 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 <laughs> Look Mini, for them. Mini yeah. Van Halen. Well, what, a, what an internal <laughs> argument. Well, and uh, yeah, a beautiful well, thing. I think it's all about doing music when you love it. Mm -hmm. And and my wife Ginger and I are sort of over specialized almost in doing our early American music, but we love it. Uh, and we do programs you know, throughout the country, at museums, educational, uh, historical societies. But 
at least one evening a week, we get our buddies together and we sing Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young and, and just you know play around with what we grew up There's with. There's nothing wrong with that. Do you play yeah. an instrument? I was a voice major and an early music person. So you use an instrument. Mm -hmm. That is really incredible. The, okay, let me ask you this. Musical Maryland. So now you have, now you have those singing colonial songs. How did that morph into modern, the, the modern use of voice in music? Well, that's a really good question. I think it was just a natural, from the very beginning, it was falling together. You know, people were just crying out in joy and lamentation and had music along with them. Yeah, you have to, to realize that music served all those functions and more than it does today. Worship, recreational dance, accompanying theater, protest songs. That's a very important thing. When John Dickinson's Liberty Song was sung under the Liberty Trees in Baltimore and Annapolis, that's a protest song. And, and all, there's music, there's plenty of commercial music just to, done to make money, which, but if you go back well into my period, the music was much more on an amateur level. I think most of the people who were singing, they d grew up singing. They didn't have the formal training. Um, we have a, a wonderfully Mm -hmm. rich historical record of African-American music making. We're in slaves and freed blacks here in Baltimore on the Eastern Shore. We're making banjos and making flutes and, and we're getting cheap fiddles that they could accompany dancing upon. Um, it's an extremely rich story. You had asked before about do other states, you know, is, is Maryland unique? Yeah, sure, you can look at the history of music in Florida. There's a book on that, History of Music in New Jersey, go to Wyoming, it's going to be cowboy songs mostly. The beauty of Maryland is that we have everything. We've got sea shanties being brought in up the bay by the sailors. We've got work songs, uh, Menhaden, oystering songs. Uh, you've got people out in the western parts digging the canals and singing Irish work songs. In the cities, you've got uh, people worshiping in English and in German in the multiple churches here. And, and especially talk about religious variety in the city of Baltimore. My gosh, you've got you know, Irish Catholics, French Catholics, German Catholics, Protestant, um, Jewish immigrants coming in great numbers, Russian, Ukrainian. They're all bringing their folk music. They're bringing their songs to worship by and everything else is very rich. And then you roll out gospel and that's its, and that's its own volumes. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. Um, musical Maryland, history of song and performance from the colonial period to the age of radio. David Elizabeth, well done. A job well done. Somebody <laughs> had to put it down, and you got you were you you were put in charge, mm. well, and you, you did a great job. Appreciate awesome. that. Thank you. Now, and how are you going to live up to this oh. now? <laughs> oh. oh, one more thing. There's also part of the website that gives music recorded samples for free. You can download. What is the website? What is the website, please? Did, uh, I printed it up here. Is it colonialmusic.org? No, but it would be this one up here. Oh, it's J H U P Books dot Press. Dot jhu dot edu. It's a long link. Mm -hmm. uh, we can put it on our website. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll link. You know, we will link to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Johns Hopkins Press. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find just 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 a search engine them. Sure. Johns Hopkins Press, and it will take you right there. Your website is colonialmusic.org. Right. And you have a bunch of lectures all fall. We have things going on in Annapolis, Fred, Frederick this uh, Friday, yes. Uh, so all that information's on your site. That's all up on our concert schedule, yeah. And some we're sharing. We're doing special events at the um, George Peabody Library mm -hmm. and at the Hopkins Club. Um, it's important to have a crab cake before you do a, a lunch <laughs> Yeah, it is. That's out of sight. Great job, guys. Well, thanks. And I'm hoping that my next project will be with a colleague from Peabody focusing on music in the African-American community. The story is so big that it warrants probably a dozen books, but we're going to try to do one. Well, I'll tell you what, when you do it, you come, come back. on back in. <laughs> the door is always open for you. It's open for both of you. Thank you. Please Appreciate come back in and join us. Very Thank good. You. All it's right. We'll get to work on it. We'll see you in about a week. <laughs> right. Just joking on that. All right, everybody, here well, it is. Thank you both. Oh, the pleasure's yeah. all ours. Yeah. Musical yeah. Maryland.